Hi, hey everyone, and welcome to the HIPAC Geophysics Software Webinar. My name is Brittany Hines, Marketing Specialist here at HIPAC, and I will be your host for today's presentation. Before we begin, I just want to remind you about the question box on the side of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit them using the question drop down. Also, if you're unable to hear us or the screen goes blank, please comment in the chat box so we can fix the issue. For today's webinar, we are going to show you all the new features in our new product, HiPAC Geophysics. Our presenters for today's presentation are Daniel Tobin and Ken Aiken from HiPAC Programming, and they both bring great experience and expertise to our company, and we're happy to have them here with us today to talk more about our new product, HiPAC Geophysics. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, my name is Daniel Tobin, and I've been with HiPAC since 2014. And I'm joined by Ken, who I'll let introduce himself. Hello, I'm Ken Aiken. I've been a programmer with HiPAC since 2009. All right, and today we're going to be going over our new product, HiPAC Geophysics. Just a quick overview of what the presentation is going to hold today. We're going to go over the basics of the new product. We'll go over setting up a new HiPAC project, including setting your geodesy. And then we'll go into a demo of side scan, bag, and sub bottom collection and editing for each of them. So what is HiPAC Geophysics? It's a new product from HiPAC. It is a product that includes side scan, magnetometer, and sub bottom data collection and post-processing. Across those three types of survey devices we have 70 different sonars and magnetometers supported in the product and we are fully featured which means that you get all of the uh, features of the standard HIPEC um, side scan mag and sub bottom acquisition and processing we also have asv and usv support so if you have unmanned vehicles that's supported in this product and we have very precise positioning through RTK enhanced GPSs. A couple other perks of the HiPAC Geophysics product is that it is easy and straightforward using our new HiPAC program. We have a simplified shell interface to keep the user interface simple and clean. It's cost effective, so it's a more uh, budget option than some of our larger packages. However, if you find yourself needing some of the bigger features in the newer packages and the bigger packages, you can upgrade it. It's also included in the maintenance plan. So if you are on the maintenance plan, you'll receive new devices, bug fixes, and new features every quarter. You also get access to our tech support team over phone and email. And now we'll go to Ken, who will present the project setup. Thank you, Daniel. So the... Uh... When you first open up HiPAC, you'll be greeted with the project wizard. Uh, this allows you to select your project, copy a project, or as you would be doing the first time you open it, creating a new project. In the, in the uh, project wizard, you can set a UTM or state plane grid very quickly and easily, as well as several other grids that HIPAC supports. It's a very nice and simple way for new users to create a project. Alternatively, there's the more classic way in HIPAC to create a project. Under the file menu, you can select new project, set a name, and then you can go into the geodetic parameters, which I will do right now. So in here, see there's the option to use a EPSG code in grids or one of the high pack uh, predefined grids where we have a large number of grids from all over the world. Put 
as well as many different uh, options for a predefined grid or any datum corrections that you may wish to do and a large number of RTK tied options. And at that point, your project is all set up. And then you can set up your hardware. So when you're setting up your hardware, it's important to have a position device. That's gonna be the position of either your sonar or your main vessel. And if you're running a towfish, you'll have to add that as well. And finally, of course, you'll need your acquisition device. And we'll go into a quick demonstration of how that's set up. So you'll click on the little microchip icon here. And that will bring up your hardware program. I'm going to do File New so we have a clean hardware program to demo with. So this is how yours will likely look when you first launch hardware. To add your position device, you'll go to boat, and then from available devices, you can select position, and that will show just position devices. And from here, you can select from any of these position devices. Once you find the one you want, you can click on add, which will move it into the installed column on the right. You'll also see it appear under the boat on the left. Then you can click on setup, which brings up the device setup window. We won't be going over in detail how to configure this because every device, every position device is gonna have a different setup window. You can also go to, once you've done that, you can go to the Survey Connect tab and click the little ellipsis next to Device Connection, which will bring up the Device Connection window. And from here, you can see the different data connection types we support. If I've selected Serial and I click OK, you can see the COM port test button gets enabled. And if I click on this, it will list all of the COM ports available on my computer, whether or not they're connected, what device they're assigned to, and any data streaming over them. So this is a quick way to double check that you've selected the right COM port. If I've selected network test or network connection type, the network test button gets enabled and I can click that and I can ping the IP address I have here to make sure I'm connected to that device. And if it's a UDP device, I can click UDP connect and see data streaming in. There's also a more advanced test which loads up the actual device into a device test window. You can see I don't have a device connected so there's no data coming in. So once you've added your position device, you'll need to add a sonar. And as an introduction, we'll talk about side scan collection. So first I'm gonna add a side scan device to my, to my hardware program. So to do that, I click on hardware and I click include under side scan survey. And you'll see a side scan survey option appears on the left here. If I click on that, I can see all of the side scan devices we support. If you have an analog device, you can select this first option and that will handle that device. If you have a digital device, you can select from this list of devices here. For example, if I add this, but this device, I can either double click it or click on add. If I double click it, it appears in the installed column. And then I can click on setup and it'll bring up the device setup window. Again, this is different for every sonar, so I'm not gonna go into detail on the setup window process here. Once you've set up your device, you can set the connection in here, set the IP address in the port, and then you can use the network test or test device button to test the actual connection. If you're running a toad system, you'll need to add a towfish. And you can do that by right clicking on hardware at the top left here and click add mobile and then check installed on towfish for the side scan survey and that will move your sonar into the mobile 
You'll also need to configure your position device for your mobile. So if you click on your mobile, you'll need to find Towfish in this list. And a quick way to get to the, the item you're looking for is to type the words, the first letters of the device you're looking for. So if I'm looking for the Towfish and I type in T-O-W, you can see it scrolls me down to the Towfish device here. I'll click add. And the setup for this will be very, um, is a little more involved in, than the GPS device. And we'll go into a little detail here. At the top, you can choose your cable counter if you have one. I'll leave it on manual layback for now. Layback method, you can likely leave this as it is. Same for map display. For A-frame offsets, you'll enter the measurements from your boat's uh, center to the tow point of your cable counter. For correction factors, the catenary factor is how much the distance from the tow point to your tow fish will shorten as the vessel moves forward and applies drag to that cable. For most cases, you can leave that on 0.81 and you can adjust that if you know the catenary factor of your cable. For depth source, you can select mobile depth and then select shallow fish, which will mean that you have a fish that is not at any depth, at which point the depth will just be zero. If your mobile or your tow fish has an altitude or depth sensor, you can set that here, or you can tell it that it's running at, uh, it's a deep fish, which means it's running at a very high depth. If your side scan sonar has a depth sensor, you can select that and click depth sensor. And once you've configured this, you can click OK. And just like our other devices, you configure the connection in here to your cable counter. And that's how you set up the hardware for a side scan survey. So when you're planning your survey, it's important to remember how the swath covers the bottom. If you are trying to run a quicker survey, you can do 100% coverage where the ends of your swaths line up and you'll just want to make sure your lines are spaced a little bit shorter than the swath so that you can account for um, piloting errors or driving errors without losing coverage. If you want to run a very detailed survey, you can do 200% coverage where each swath will line up with the center line directly beneath the previous line, the previous line's uh, sonar coverage. And again, you'll want to account for a little bit of um, position error for that so that you're not making gaps. When you're surveying, you'll want to run at around four to five knots. And you do not want to stop while you're towing a tow fish because if you stop, the towfish will sink through the water and it could hit the bottom, which would be very expensive. And you also don't wanna turn while you're collecting your data because that will introduce very strange artifacts in your collection. For altitude, you'll wanna run at about 10% of your sonar's range. So if you're running at 300 feet, you'll wanna run at about a 30 foot altitude. And now we'll move into the actual survey program. So I'm gonna use the project manager to move to a different project I have set up. I'll just quickly show that what the hardware looked like for this one. You can see I have a position simulator and a side scan simulator and the towfish added. So if I click on the whale icon, that will launch the survey program. And you'll see a number of windows pop up here. On the left side is your map window. Underneath it, I have a few devices, specifically the simulator and the towfish device. 
And on the right, I have the side scan waterfall. It's a good idea to take a few moments at the start of each survey to position your, your uh, windows as you'll likely be looking at them for a long time. So you get them how you like them. Starting on the right here, at the top, we can see our signal graph. And that is showing the sonar's return. Underneath that, we can see the waterfall, which shows the sonar's imagery, as well as our bottom tracking. In the signal graph here, if I click and drag this slider down, that adjusts our color limits. If I drag that way down, you can see that the starboard, the port side has gotten a lot brighter. And if I drag that back up, you can see it gets dimmer. I like to position these so that the tops of the peaks of the signal are just clipping beyond it. And if you want to, you can even drag the bottom slider up and that will set your dark levels. So you can bring out your shadows a little more. If you see something interesting in your waterfall, you can double click on it to make a target. And that will bring up our target window. In here, you can zoom in on your object if you'd like. You can also retarget if you find that your target was off a little bit. So you click the retarget button and click again in this window. It will move the target. If the target indicator is covering your object, you can check this little box or uncheck it, and that will turn it into a smaller indicator so you can see the object more clearly. If you zoomed in too far, you can click Zoom Extents, which will pull out to show both the port and starboard sides. And you'll notice this is a slant range corrected image. So it is removing the water column. If I mark a target again, on the left here, you can see a little target indicator has appeared next to our towfish. So targets marked in the waterfall will appear on the map on the left. If I click on options, this brings up the options window. Included in here are a number of color options, so you can choose between different colors. I recommend the gold 24-bit color. You also have a few color options in here to adjust the brightness and contrast. Next is the gain menu. So we can apply gain to our image as uh, you'll need to brighten your image as the sonar ping returns through the water. So if I set this to none, you can see we have a pretty dim image. I can also select auto TVG, which is sort of a one click, one and done option to get a quick gain that works really well. If you drag the sensitivity slider up, you'll make a brighter image. And if you drag it down, you'll make a dimmer image. I should mention now, if you make any changes in this window, they are not recorded to the file. So you don't need to worry about accidentally setting your gains incorrectly and ruining your data. All the data we saved is not modified as it comes from the sonar. And this is the other option I was using the decibels over 100 meters option. So if I drag this all the way up, you can see our signal graph has lost the data. So if I click the arrow, I can move it down so I can see the data. Ignoring the waterfall, just looking at the signal graph, I can see that the ends of our swath are curving up as if the signal graph is smiling. We wanna make that graph so that it appears mostly flat. So if I drag this down, to about there, you can see our signal return is mostly flat. It's not curving up or down at the ends. And from there, I can adjust my sliders to get a nice image. The next option is the display option. Most of these are pretty self-explanatory. This can turn on range lines. You can adjust the colors for that. You can show just the port or starboard option. You can choose to remove the water column, but I don't recommend this as if you remove the water column, you do not 
you have a less of an effective idea of your fish's altitude. So I would recommend leaving this on while you're running acquisition. The next tab is our bottom tracking. We have a few options in here. The first option is the high scan bottom tracking. We have a sensitivity slider here. So if I lower the sensitivity, that will lower the bottom tracking into the water column further. So it will be less eager to find a bottom. That's what useful if you have a particularly murky water column. If I drag this slider up, it will be more eager to find a bottom. So you want to drag this into an area where it's just meeting the bottom and not clipping down too, too low. And if your fish has a altitude sensor, you can use that as well. And you can see this data that we're playing back does have altitude data. The next thing I'll go over are these four big green buttons along the top. The first one, nav, side scan, and devices. Those will appear yellow or red if there's any errors in those devices, those device categories. And the fourth one is your altitude. And if you click on this, it brings up a second window with your altitude display. And you can click on the side scan controls window to set an alarm limit. So if I set this to 30 meters, you can see that because we're below 30 meters, it's now displaying it as an alarm. But if I set this to 20 meters, you can see it appears tinted green because we are at an out appropriate height. And you can see we just dropped below that, so it turned red. On the left side is our map. And one of the big features in high pack geophysics is that you can do real-time mosaicing. So if I click on side scan mosaic, and I make sure that this is checked so that it says enabled, I can set the cell size, and this is how much each pixel of the cell covers. So right now it's set to 0.1 and we're in meters. So each pixel is gonna cover a 10 square centimeter area. You can either have this always updating or just while logging. And you can set a blend percentage if you're running parallel lines to how it will blend with previous lines. So I had it set to while logging. So if I go to logging and start logging, the first thing you might notice is that there's a blue line that has appeared in the waterfall. That's just an indicator showing that we're logging now. The other thing you'll notice is that our side scan imagery is now being imposed over the map here. This front icon is the boat, and this back icon is the towfish. If you want to, you can control the towfish using this window. So I can reel in the towfish, and you can see the towfish is sliding closer and closer to the vessel. And I can also let cable out for the towfish, which is pushing it back. If I click start, if I click end logging, these mosaics will get saved and you can view them later for marking targets. One other feature I'll mention is the snapshot option. So if I see something interesting and I don't want to mark a target there, or if I want to capture a precise image of it, I can click the camera icon, drag a box over it, and that will create an image. Lastly, I mentioned it before, but if you're running a survey, make sure that you start your logging. That's another reason to leave your side scan mosaic option set to while logging, so you have a, a more apparent indicator that you're not logging. So a couple of the features in high pack geophysics for side scan acquisition is you of course get your real time mosaicing and a new and improved high quality waterfall. We took a lot of time in the last year to improve the imagery in our waterfall and we're really proud to present it here in the geophysics product. 
You can also, of course, target in the waterfall or the mosaic. We have over 40 digital sonars supported and any analog sonar that connects to a national instruments digital to analog converter. And this is all available in the HIPAC geophysics product. Next, I'll talk a little bit about SideScan post-processing. So once you've acquired your data, you can process that and create mosaics. So again, I'm going, I'm, again, I'm going to change product projects here using the project manager. If I go to processing and click targeting and mosaicing, this will load our SiteScan Mosaic program. The first thing I want to do is go to File, Open, and that will take me into the project folder. Your SiteScan data is going to be stored first in the raw folder, and that's where all of the data you acquired will go during your survey. And once you've made your edits to that project, to those, those lines, when you save it, it will be saved into the edit folder. So your original acquisition data will never be overwritten. So again, you don't have to worry about, just like an acquisition, making changes to gains or bottom tracking. You don't have to worry about that affecting the recorded data in post-processing as well. So I can choose from any of these file types and we'll review them all in, uh, after this uh, demo. The log file organizes your data into convenient logs categorized by date. However, if you want to see each of the individual files, you can choose supported files and that will display all of them. So I'll double click on this file to load it. And we'll take a moment to load the data and it will present us with the read parameters menu. From here, I can choose my navigation. So we were using the mobile or the towfish for this. So I'll select mobile. I can choose what device or how I want to get my heading. Course over ground, line azimuth. If my sonar has a heading device, I can choose that. Or if I'm, again, if I just want to use the towfish's calculated heading, I can use that as well. I can choose which frequency I want to show. This data set happens to only have one frequency, so I'm going to select that option. If I go to device info, I can set offsets for each of my devices and mobiles. Survey info shows a little basic information about the survey, and we won't be reviewing the advanced tab in this presentation. I should mention if you want a more detailed tutorial, we have those available on our website. So I'll click OK, and after a moment, it will load the data. Our SideScan Mosaic program is split up into three stages. We're right now in the first stage called raw data. The second stage is the scan view, and the third stage is mosaic. The first window in here is our altitude window. You may not be able to see it very well over the stream, but there's a blue line tracking our bottom here. However, if I don't have a very good bottom tracker, if I want to manually digitize it, I can click on the digitize button, and then I can come into here and I can click and place digitizing markers. And then if I click this again, it will apply those bottom tracking changes. If I realize I've made a mistake, I can go to tools and click undo, and that will uh, reverse the changes I've made. We have the uh, auto bottom detection, otherwise known as the high scan bottom tracking which we already saw a little bit of in acquisition. But we already have a pretty good bottom track with this data set, so I'm not gonna use that. Next is our heading. You can see that our heading was at about 158 degrees. However, there's some variance here. So I'll click on the smooth heading button, and you can see that that smooths out the data a little bit, which is great when you're trying to mosaic your data as the pings will not overlap with each other as much. And next is our track lines window. I can also smooth our positioning out. There's a number of controls in here involving blanking imagery or deleting positioning, but we won't be going into that in this presentation. The next tab is our scan view tab. 
and this will display a, a very familiar image. It will it is a uh, waterfall, just like we saw in acquisition. And I can scroll through this and look at my data in detail. If I see something I like, I can target it just like in acquisition by double clicking on it and it will render a larger view of that target. If I want to quickly mark a number of targets, I can click on the quick mark button and just click wherever I'd like to mark a target. If I want to adjust the bottom tracking, I can do that in this window as well, just like in the first option. I can also save a bitmap or a JPEG of this waterfall. So if I click on this, it will save the entire waterfall to a file. I also have a side scan controls window, just like in acquisition. A lot of these controls will be very familiar. The only addition we have is the angle varied gain option, which is a gain option um, that we brought over from GeoCoder. So I can adjust the sliders in this window to create an attractive image. And of course, we have the display tab as well. Again, a lot of these options are brought over from acquisition. The only new thing is the blank imagery adjacent to Nader option. So the imagery directly beneath your vessel is going to be very obscured. You're not going to get very great imagery there. So if you have overlapping lines, you can turn this on and blank an area set that you can set here next to your Nader. We don't have any overlapping lines here, so I'm not going to use that. So if I click OK, you can see the imagery will get the imagery changes will get applied here. If I want to tune a specific area or adjust my, my line tuning while looking at a specific area, I can right click in that area and you can see the preview window here will appear. So I'm going to bring this bottom slider up to make the shadows a little punchier. And I think the image looks a little blown out, so I'm going to darken it by sliding the top sliders up. Once I've done all that, I can go to the last stage, which is mosaicing. If I had multiple lines loaded, they would appear here. I could also switch between them using this dropdown. The mosaicing will use whatever frequency you have selected. Next is our resolution option. A lot like in real-time acquisition, we can set the number of, again, where our, our, our project is in meters. So this is meters per pixel. So each meter will cover a 10 by 10 centimeter area. If I'm running parallel lines, I can adjust how those lines overlap. If we want to take the average of the two lines, the max, the min, or just overlay new lines over old lines. Fill gaps and remove water column, you can leave those checked. And finally, if you want to apply a filter over the last, the ending image, you can do that here. And if you have a border file, you can add that here, and that will clip the image to your border. So I'll click on Make Mosaic. And after a few seconds, it will render the image. And there's our final mosaic. And I can zoom in. And I can make more adjustments to the imagery if I want to and re-render it. But this is a fully geo-referenced mosaic. If I save this now, this will get saved into the edit folder as HS2 data. So that saves all of my bottom tracking and gain settings. So a couple of features to review with the HiPAC Geophysics package, you'll get you'll be able to load, of course, data created in HiPAC, 
as well as data recorded in CMAX, EdgeTech, or Klein acquisition software. So you can post-process those as well. I showed you how to do altitude heading and position editing, as well as targeting in the waterfall. And of course, the final feature was the high resolution mosaicing. And all of this is available in HIPAC geophysics. So now I'll uh, pass it off to Ken, who will go over magnetometer. Thank you, Daniel. So we've been doing a uh, fair amount of work over the last couple of years, re, uh, refining our magnetometer. So, so uh, magnetometer has a somewhat similar setup to in hardware to uh, sub bottom and side scan. Let me uh, switch over to my part. Uh, to a good project. Um, in the high pack shell, you can have multiple different project uh, folders for network locations, flat external hard drives. So you see, I've got a group here. Switch over to this pro this project. And this is an example of a uh, if you if ignoring the simulation positioning is an example of a fixed mounted magnetometer hardware although you could also you may also be using a towfish which would be the same as side scan as daniel explained so when you go to set up your magnetometer uh, there's not a whole lot you need to do at setup time in here, except select your device. We support over 20 different uh, manufacturers and devices with our with our magnetometer driver. So that going, um, and then after you've selected that. It's a good idea to set up a rough idea of your gamma range. And this will filter the data you've got coming through. The rest of it you can ignore until you're in survey, because those will adjust, change the way it is displayed. So, come in here. Typically, you're magnetometer is going to be connected by a, a serial com port so you can set the com port and speed the rest you can typically ignore but i've just i'm just going to be playing back a acquired file so i can come in here test the file see that data is coming through all the through here and at the bottom you can see the uh the actual lines that are coming in. So if you don't see anything up here, but you do see data down here, you may have the wrong format selected. But we've everything looks good. So we can go into survey. So we don't see any data being drawn on the graph right now. Uh, that's because the our scaling is too small and it's not centered well. So I can manually adjust the center value in this box and the scaling here, or I can just hit the zoom extents and it'll snap to the data that I have. And if I want, I can bring out that scale a little bit more. So the blue line here correlates to these value, these blue values on our chart. Uh, that's the first value for the scaling and the red line is the second. If you feel that's too much, you can come in here and disable one of the traces. So, 
can just see the, the bright red ones, nice easy to see. And if we want, we can change the display to vertical it's a little, and we can decrease the scale now. So it fits in a bit better. Can change how much is shown in the display. So I, if you're if it's running off too quickly, so swap over to here, and now it'll take much longer to lose, and it'll be a lot easier to keep a nice fixed scale and center. Additionally, we can draw it to the survey map over here in our chart. And disable it, change the width, keep it nice and wide so it comes over well through the webinar. Or, and if it's blocking out our data, we can always lower the transparency. While surveying the greater metric display for it is useful for finding any uh, quick peaks can enable it to ping so that when you do come across something, you get alerted, and then you can come into the map window, and you can quickly drop a target by, by clicking on it, or you can just hit F5, and that drops a target right where the vessel is. Additionally, on some survey computers, you know, you're on a boat, small monitors, space can be at a premium. So instead of having this big window, you can just have a nice small gamma display and minimize it, this off to the side. And that's surveying with the magnetometer. So now let's let's look at some uh, some acquired data. So this is the magnetometer editor. Uh, we've done a lot of work updating the display and giving a lot more editing and features to it over the last couple of years. Uh, I'll load up a log file. Typically have one of one for the one of these for each day. So we've got a catalog of all the files. I'm just going to load a few just for the speed of loading. So you want to come in here, make sure you've got the right device selected and the right positioning if you're using a towfish. You might have you might you would select that here. Additionally, you can do IDRF corrections for your raw gamma. And if you have short base data, you can apply that as well. Those both take a long time, so I'm not going to do that during the presentation, just because there's it's slow to calculate. This will show you all the uh, out values that your magnetometer device might output. This one just outputs gamma and a G ratio. However, other devices will output altitude or depth, as well as you might have multiple gammas and a difference between the gammas. Hit OK. 
load in the data, and we can look at our lines in the survey window. Now I've just loaded a couple in here, but alternatively, I could, if you, after you've brought data in, you can save your session, and that will save to our SMI file in the edited folder. So we had raw 0721 for our edited. It, our log file is mag with the same numbers. And if I change the filter, I can see a list of all those SMI files in, the, in there. So make sure we select our catalog file. This is additionally other log formats. Fortunately, that log isn't is a widely used output format. But you know these files came, it's a log file from HyPack, so we'll select that. And we can select all the files. And if they've already got IGRF and chore based data, that will come through. We don't need to apply it a second time. So you can see all of our nice lines. So we'll swap to showing our gamma. And now this is already nicely, nicely set up, but if I swapped over to a color table that it was not, not so nicely set up for our gamma values, we can just quickly auto scale those and get a nice range for our color palette. In here, you can check to see any points of interest quickly. And if you want, you can make you can quickly mark a target wherever your cursor is as well as editing the lines if anything goes if you've got bad positioning and don't want to use any use it in a certain spot for instance this line came went way off the center line there so we'll swap to current line only editing we can drag a box here select where we went way off our line and now it will interpolate between those two positions. Or it removes all those positions. Or we can interpolate between those. If you ever delete something you didn't mean to, there's always a nice undo button right here. So let's find a point worth looking at. Swap back over to our cursor. Can see I've already marked a couple of targets for this one. Swap over to our profile view. And if we really want to know whether, okay, we, we could see this, but it's it's a little bit hard to tell because of the squishing. And this is going in our x-axis on this chart is time. We can bring up our magnetic analysis click two points on either side of that peak and it brings up this window and now we can see okay it took us seven uh, feet to pass this 1.49 seconds the minimum value of our of it our, our maximum and the difference between those as well as we can click around here, set our point names. And if we went a little outside of the, what we think of the peak, we can tune this in a little bit, setting our value in the center, 
our increment value in the center. All right, see, I went too far on the left. I can always drop this down a little bit. And that's a lot better. Then once we're satisfied, we can select our target group and mark target. Additionally, we can write to an RTF so that you can give it to people outside it of the HiPack environment. So I'm just going to override this file. And now our point is saved to that file. And every additional time I come, I do click this. It won't pop that up, it will just save it to the same file, making it quick and easy. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty of your data, you can come in here, see your gamma. If you want, you can add positioning. as well as drag objects around in here to change the order. Maybe I want, or just get rid of. If you're working with shore values, we've got a nice easy button to display them. Additionally, you can, if you get something you really like and you wanna move it between projects or give it to other users, move it between computers. You can save and load the layout of your, of your spreadsheet. You can also export a nice CSV of, of those values. Finally, one of the uh, bigger features we added into magnetometer editing is our sort and contour options. Just do the contour since it includes, it gives you the option for sorting here at the bottom. So, so this is this window is a duplicate from our tin program. If you're already familiar with that. So we can select contours, come in here, select a step, play with our contour attributes. Let's give it just a quick test to see if that's a good if that's a good step first. And you can see it's really kind of cluttered. It's hard to to tell much, so I'm going to increase this to, I can just type in a custom value here. Hit test. And that's a lot easier and better to see. Go into contour attributes. If I want, I can display labels. I can color these with our color scale or set a custom color to highlight a specific value. Oops, and I clicked out of it. Okay, so I'm just gonna come through, select everything, hit high pack, hit test and I can out export these values this if I like it I can export it additionally I can select solid area come back in here it's cleared change my grid spacing a little bit hit test And now with solid area selected, I've got some nice build hatches. All right, and I 
and if, once I'm happy with this, I can either hit save, which will save it with the default naming, or save as. I can come in here. So you can see these two files are an example of the default naming. Mag edit, the name of, name of the value we selected to use, and the time that they were saved. 1410, which would be 2 p.m. So just gonna save over one of these files. Hit save, now it's done. And in look at my nice DXF. Here in the survey display. And if I decide to go back, I can always just turn off the contour, turn back on my gamma. If I want to get back into the data. And that's editing with the MAGA edit. Yeah. Now I'll send you back with to Daniel for sub bottom collection and processing. All right, thanks, Ken. So that's all great. That's all available in the HIPEC geophysics product. Uh, additionally, we have a very robust sub-bottom acquisition and processing um, suite of tools. Um, so first we'll talk about sub-bottom acquisition. I'll switch back to the shell here and change projects again. Just to show you what a hardware setup looks like for this, we have a position device and the sub-bottom driver. When you're adding the sub-bottom driver, you'll need to click on Setup and choose your device from this dropdown. You can find the sub-bottom device in this list if you start to type it, SUB, it appears here. If you don't find it in this list, make sure you have all devices selected, as if you have just position selected, the sub-bottom device will not appear. And you can, of course, configure your data connection in here. I have this set to playback a file. So I'll click the whale, Smart Launch Survey. And you'll see a somewhat similar view to what we had in SiteScan Survey. I have the windows swapped here, so on the right is our map, and on the left is our vertical waterfall. On the right side of this window is our raw data, our signal graph, and on the left is the waterfall. Starting from the top left here, I can open up the device settings. If you're connected to an actual device, you'll have options for things like changing the range or changing the intensity. Because I'm just playing back data, I just have the file playback window. Next is our view options window. Auto scale will show me the entire depth. If I turn this off and click apply, you can see we've trimmed the display to just the range I've selected. I can also turn off our bottom detect. So if I turn that off and click apply, this red indicator will disappear. That red indicator is our bottom tracking. I can also display the grid and change the grid stepping and display it either in meters or milliseconds. The next option is our sub-bottom controls. This brings up a somewhat complex window here. The first option we have is our bandpass filter. So if you want to apply bandpass filtering to your data, you can do that here. Below that is our uh, spectrum analyzer. So this shows the strength, the, the uh, spectrum return from every ping. 
you can set your minimum and maximum for the filter here. A good starting point is to take your sonar's frequency, double it, and use that as the maximum, and have it and use that as the minimum. So this was a four kilohertz sonar. So half of that would be two, double that would be eight. And you can see this was tuned just a little bit more to 7.2. Next is our TVG option. So we have TVG just like in side scan. This first option applies, uh, applies gain to the entire swath, the entire depth. So you can see if I turn that all the way up, it blacks out the image. And if I turn that really low, we don't apply a lot of gain. If I turn that all the way to the very lowest setting, this will change to say B, and our water column will disappear. So you can blank the water column if you want to have a nice clean image. This next TVG will apply from the bottom tracking down. So that's great if you're running in deep water and you want to apply gains starting at the bottom penetration and not in the water column or if you're in an area where the depth is changing rapidly. So here you can see I have this turned all the way up. And unlike the first slider, it's not being applied in the water column. It's only being applied from the bottom tracking. This third slider, you might notice it doesn't do anything at first. If I set the delay to something like 15 and then slide it up, you can see that it starts applying its gains at the delay I set from the bottom. So 15 milliseconds beyond the bottom track is when the gain will be applied here. And that's great if you're running in deep penetration and you want to apply a different gain farther down in the water call in the uh, through your, your sonar uh, ping than earlier. Bottom tracking is a lot like we had in side scan survey. Color by amplitude. So all of the sonars that come into high pack will return their data at a range that is somewhat arbitrary. So we have to have this option to change the colors, the color limits. If you just come in here and click auto scale, that will get you to a pretty good area in terms of darkness and brightness. If you're running bipolar data, you can select that from here and negative data will appear white and positive will appear black. You can also select unipolar, which will just display the positive sides of your sonar ping, or rectified, which will take the absolute value of your sonar ping. And you can also, of course, apply color where red will be negative and blue will be positive. And if you've come in here and you've messed with your settings and you don't like what you've done, you can click revert changes and that will reset all of your settings back to what they were when this window first opened. If you notice, my bottom tracking is no longer accurate. So what I can do is actually I can click where I think the bottom is and it will snap down there and start tracking it more accurately. And if I double click in here, I can mark a target where I think something of interest would be. And of course, you'll always have to remember to start your logging before you do any acquisition. So now we'll review some of the features that I showed off. You can of course do the waterfall targeting. You can apply real-time filtering to your data. We have TVG and color controls available. There is 10 different digital sonars supported. And if you have an analog sonar, we can take that in. Again, as long as it comes through a national instruments converter. And this is all available in HIPAC Geophysics. And the last thing I'm going to demo in this presentation for HIPAC Geophysics is the sub bottom processing that is available with the product. So after I've done my acquisition, I can click processing and sub click sub bottom processing, which will open up the sub bottom processor. If I go to file, new session, it takes me into that raw folder that I talked about before. And what I like to do is sort this folder by date 
and that will group similar files or files acquired on the same day together. So I'll select these three. They were all acquired on the same day. Click open. And you'll see a little loading bar in the bottom left corner here as it loads the data and processes. I'm going to click no. I don't want to use the old project file. And after a moment, we should see some data. Now, when you first load the data, it may not look like this. If it doesn't, you can click on these two checkboxes, zoom to fit width and height, and that will zoom out to show the entire file. There's a little drop down here to show the files we have loaded, and you can click on these to switch between them. And after a moment of loading, it will draw the file. And you can see that the highlighted file will change on the right here in the view tracks window to indicate which file we have selected. To process your data, you kind of move from left to right in the settings window here. So the display tab is just some display settings you can tweak to make your imagery uh, nicer to see. The frequency filter is a lot like what we saw in acquisition, where you can set the low and high cutoffs. So I've already applied that here. For the dynamic range, it's very similar again to the color range we saw in acquisition, where you can set the minimum and maximum, and whether it's bipolar, rectified, or unipolar data. We have a selection of color scales as well. You can apply gain by tweaking these sliders and clicking apply. And you'll see the gain being applied in the signal graph on the left. You can also create your own custom gain by coming in here and choosing user defined and dragging the slider bars here to adjust the gain curve that you are applying. but I'm going to switch it back to the original one. For bottom tracking, this one is a little complicated, but the first thing you want to do is find out how long your bang pulse was. And the bang pulse is the sub bottom releasing its initial pulse and hearing it. So that's this dark spot at the top. If I look at the bottom left corner where it says depth, as I move my cursor through this window, you can see that change. And I can see that the bang pulse fizzles out around three milliseconds. So I'll set the bang pulse duration to three, click estimate, and then click calculate new seedbed. And you'll see a blue line appear tracking the bottom. If it missed an area or it didn't do a very good job tracking, I can check manually pick seedbed and click around where I think the bottom should be. And if I uncheck that, the blue line will change to track that bottom. I can also smooth the bottom, to smooth out any peaks that I found. And I'm gonna go back to the original here and I'll click smooth once. Sound velocity and tide, if you have those two, you can load them in and that will be applied to any exports that we can do, EDT or XYZs, and I'll show those at the end. The view tracks window, this affects the window on the right here. So if I tell it to show the seabed and I set the range to maybe two meters, whoops. Maybe two meters to say 12 meters. You can see the color changing in here to track the bottom. So purple is our 12 meter depth, which correlates with the right around here. And two is our two meter depth, which, which correlates with the top of the line here. I'll also mention this, as I move my cursor through this window, you'll see the information on the right updating. 
And you'll also see a little cursor, which may not be super visible over the stream, moving through the, the view tracks window as I move my cursor to indicate where I am. Layback correction and latency can also be applied to our EDT and XYZ exports. Fence diagram I'll come back to. And of course, you can apply a border file to your exports as well. So I'm going to jump back to the display tab. And I'll take your attention to the very top here where we have reflectors. So if you choose a reflector, you can name it. I'll name this one red. And then you can click along the bottom where you think you found a reflector in your data. So there's one reflector. If I come down here and I choose another one, I can rename it, call it, say, yellow. And I can track a different reflector with this. If I get to an area where I've lost track of the reflector, but I can see it further in the data, what I can do is I can right click on the node and click toggle end to node. And then the next target, I, the next node I click won't have a line between it to indicate that there's a gap in the reflector tracking there. We have a little checkbox here called display isopack polygon, which I like to say is a complicated way of saying color between the lines. So if I check this, you can see up here it's colored red between the seabed and the first reflector that I've named reflector red. I can create up to two more of these polygons. So if I click add polygon, I'm going to color it between the red reflector and the yellow reflector. And I'll make it orange. So now you can see there's an orange reflector in here. And I can change the transparency to make it opaque if I'd like, or even more transparent. The next thing I'll go over, if I go to the top left and go to File, we have a few options for exporting this data. So you can export your EDTs or XYZs, and you can do that for just the seabed, the reflectors, or everything. And you can export these and process them in um, other programs as well. The last option is the Export Fence option. So if I click on this and click All Lines, you can see our loading bar going at the bottom here. And after a few moments, we'll get a nice 3D view of our data. So let me make this a little bigger. So this is showing our data in a 3D representation. I'm actually going to do a little bit of bottom tracking on these other two. as it makes a really big impact on the data at the end. The fence diagram, I should say. So once I've done that and I do export fence again, you can see the water column is transparent on these and the reflectors also appear. I can adjust the transparency. So if I don't want these to appear transparent at all, I can make them fully opaque, or I can make them more transparent depending on their amplitude return. And then you get a kind of transparent view through them. And if I had marked other reflectors, they would also be invisible. Finally, if I go to view and click save screenshot or full line screenshot, that will save oops, this entire view to a high resolution image that you can then um, use for whatever you want, reporting or anything. And that's it for the sub auto processing. And that's also it for our demos. So now we'll move into our Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the questions here. 
The first question we had was, does our side scan survey support USBL? Uh, we do, you can bring in USBL data. Um, how, do, how do you configure that? Um, you'll have to reach out to our support team. They'll have uh, more advanced tutorials available for that. It's a little involved. Does side scan targeting and mosaicing read dual head multi-beam data? If you wanna bring in multi-beam data, you'll need to upgrade to high sweep. Um, however, you can reach out to us and contact us and see if the we can help you more directly if there is a multi-beam system that does produce side scan imagery that can be brought in to side scan targeting and mosaicing. Can we trim the data in post-processing for side scan? Yes, you can trim based on both of the range. So you can trim the port and starboard sides. And you can also trim based on position. So if there's an area that you don't want mosaic, or if you want to clip the ends of your line, you can delete those positions or delete that imagery from your, um, from your final mosaic. Can I add a towfish after collection? Uh, we can currently do fixed to fixed layback corrections. We can't do towfish position recalculating. Um, that's a feature that's going to be coming uh, hard to say when, but it's something we're working on to add towfish after collection. Ken has two, two questions here. Yeah. So when you set up the magnetometer, the gamma limit, is that will that filter the data that will filter the real time data that you see in the window but as a rule if you're logging we don't discard any any raw data during acquisition we it, it we try to save all at least as long as the string seems valid we we save it uh, can users add a custom column to the magnetometer spreadsheet? Uh, no, the, there's, there's a lot of columns there, but we don't support any uh, sort of limited columns or smooth col columns for the spreadsheet. Sorry. Uh, and then uh, Tangsberg has the raw extension data as a as trace data for their GeoPulse Compact. Uh, are we able to read that data into SVP, Daniel? No, we currently don't support .raw files in our uh, SVP program. All right. Um, and do we support the XTF files for uh, seismic uh, SVP? Is that bottom processing? No, we don't have XTF file support for that as well. We just have SegY and JSF files for uh, sub bottom processing. All right. Are there any uh, changes or improvement in the sub bottom component of this of this geophysics release that we've recently done, Daniel? Um, yeah. So there's always, I mean, the geo the sub bottom project sub bottom profiling has always been. Uh, regularly updated so it does get updates over the years and in the quarters as we find new devices and bug fixes so there's no particular um eye-catching new features in here other than it's it's freshly available in our new reduced uh geophysics package all right and if a uh, user were to have a heave sensor while surveying would they be able to apply that to their svp data uh we can't apply heave data corrections but we can apply, um, we can do a calculated heave correction. So if your data has heave in it, we can correct for that, not using the sensor, but using more of an algorithm to uh, correct it for that. Uh, we are out of time, so we're gonna wrap things up. If you have any questions, you can reach out to our sales team at sales at highpack.com for any inquiries and questions relating to the new geophysics product. And we want to thank you all for your participation and hope you enjoyed the webinar today. Everyone will get a copy of this presentation and we will get in touch with anyone who had unanswered questions over the next week. Also, please don't hesitate to contact us. We want to hear from you. 
Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for upcoming news and updates. We hope to talk to you all again soon and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you.